My name is Kenneth Harrell, and I teach uh, Greek, Roman, and Byzantine history at Tulane University in New Orleans. And I shall be giving 36 lectures dealing with a course on Alexander the Great. The scope of this course is much larger than just Alexander. We will deal with the events leading up to Alexander's accession that will require us to look at his uh, father, Philip II, conditions in Greece and in the Persian Empire, as well as a series of lectures that will be devoted to the um, impact of Alexander and the world that followed after him. But our main attention will be on this Macedonian king, who perhaps of all the individuals of antiquity, arguably all of the secular figures of history is the best known. This has been conducted through various tests by uh, interviewing Americans at the mall, that indisputable center of pop culture. It's uh, been carried out particularly by a very dear friend and colleague of mine, Eugene Borza, who is the leading expert on Macedon. And he's done a number of these surveys, and he concludes that Alexander is probably the best known secular figure bar none, although people are generally very vague about the details. So part of our uh, task will be explaining this enduring image of the king and clarifying uh, some of the obscure details. In contrast to other periods of ancient history, we don't have many contemporary sources of, on Alexander the Great. We do have accounts from classical antiquity, but these were written centuries after Alexander's death. And as a result, they pose a certain uh, problem in interpretation. It also raises the question whether there was ever any objective account of Alexander, even in ancient times. And the argument is often made that throughout history, one gets the Alexander one wants. Each historian writes about Alexander from the perspective of his, perspective of his generation, the conditions in which that historian might have uh, lived, and also how each historian might make use of these earlier sources. So it's necessary uh, uh, first to look at what these sources are. We have four narrative accounts and a fifth sort of, I like to call it a half account, that's the epitome by Justin. The most important of the four narrative accounts was written, by, was written in Greek uh, by a historian known as um, uh, Lucius Flavius Arianus Xenophon. Uh, we usually call him Arian, which is the anglicized form of the name. And he was born in the city of Nicomedia around 86 AD. He died about 146 AD. Uh, his first language was Greek, although he knew Latin, because he was a Roman senator. That is, he was a Greek provincial who attained the highest position within the Roman Empire. His account of Alexander, known as the Anabasis, uh, comes down to us in seven books. Each of those books represented a papyrus scroll in antiquity, and then he appended, uh, appended an eighth book on the uh, Indica, or the so-called Indica, which is his description of India, and he draws very heavily on the voyage of Nearchus, who was uh, Alexander's friend and admiral, who returned part of the Macedonian army from India by sailing along uh, the Indian Ocean, and, uh, and left a very vivid account of that, uh, of that uh, expedition. Uh, Arian was an experienced cavalry commander. He had fought on the Rhine, the Danube, and the Euphrates. He actually uh, left us a tactical account of how he countered nomadic cavalry, a group of people known as the Alans, who burst into Asia Minor around 135 AD when Arian was governor of Cappadocia, which is Central Asia Minor today. And that uh, battle line is directly inspired after tactical formations Alexander used in Central Asia back in 329 BC. And Arian had a certain appreciation uh, for Alexander's feet and arms because he himself was an experienced commander. He also had access to sources which no longer exist. These include important contemporary accounts. He mentions them in the start of his history. The first and foremost was the account of Ptolemy who later became king in Egypt. He was one of Alexander's boyhood friends. He's known as Ptolemy, son of Lagos. He established the succession of Macedonian kings who ruled Egypt down to 30 BC. Ptolemy uh, distinguished himself in Central Asia and India, and he, lead, he left us an eyewitness account that uh, Arian made use of and only survives in summaries and what Arian cites and also what some later historians cite. We do not have the full account of Ptolemy. 
Arian had access to other sources. These included the account of Callisthenes, the great nephew of Aristotle, who was the official court historian on the expedition, the day book, the Ephemerides, as it's called in Greek, of Eumenes of Cardia, who was the Greek secretary of Alexander, and a number of other uh, contemporary or near contemporary sources. Uh, Arian was a very suave and sophisticated writer. He had a very good sense of uh, what a court is like. He tells us that throughout his account, when he ran into discrepancies, he generally preferred Ptolemy over other sources because Ptolemy was a king and it would be inappropriate for a king to lie. Now, that is a, a comment that has caused certain consternation among historians, but Arian is being very clever here. He was a close friend to the Emperor Hadrian, who ruled from 117 to 138 AD and is remembered as the Philhellene Emperor of the Roman world. He served under and distinguished himself under the Roman Emperor Trajan, the great conqueror, the optimist princeps, the best of emperors who made eastern conquests that were compared to the conquest of Alexander. So Arian is being a bit circumspect here. He probably knew that Ptolemy's account was reliable in at least the military details. It was written at a time where uh, many of the contemporaries were still alive and Ptolemy could only go so far in distorting uh, military actions conducted by Alexander. In any case, uh, Arian's account is uh, regarded by most historians as the best. And Arian give us, gives us an explanation why he was determined to write this account. Apparently by his day, we had these contemporary sources and official documents, but no really synthetic historical account of Alexander. And therefore, it's, um, it's quite different from other periods of Greek history where we have contemporary accounts by Herodotus, Thucydides, or Polybius describing affairs in the Greek world. Arian is almost 500, 450 years after Alexander's death. This is what Arian writes about uh, the purpose of his history and the reasons why he decided to write uh, this account on the campaigns of Alexander. No prose history, no epic poem was written about him, that is Alexander. He was not celebrated even in such choral odes as preserve the name and memory of Hiero or Gilo or Thero. These are uh, tyrants of uh, Sicily from the uh, 6th and early 5th century BC. Or many other men not in the same class as Alexander with the result that the wonderful story of his life is less familiar today than of the merest non-entities of the ancient world. Now, Arian's probably exaggerating a bit here, but nonetheless, the point's well taken. Even the march of the 10,000 under Cyrus against Artaxerxes, the fate of Clearchus and his fellow prisoners, and the return under Xenophon's command to the sea are, thanks to Xenophon's history, much better known than the great achievements of Alexander. And this is the so-called expedition of 401, uh, 399 BC, known as the March of the 10,000. We'll be discussing it later. Yet, unlike Xenophon, Alexander did not hold a mere subordinate command. He was not defeated by the Persian king or victorious only over the force that tried to stop his march to the sea. On the contrary, there has never been another man in all the world, of Greek or of any other blood, who by his own hands succeeded in so many brilliant enterprises. And this is the reason why I have embarked upon the project of writing this history, in the belief that I am not unworthy to set clear before men's eyes the story of Alexander's life. No matter who I am that make this claim, I need not declare my name, though it is by no means unheard of, in the world. You know, he's a well-known Roman senator and governor. I need not specify my country and family or any official position I may have held. Rather, let me say this, that this book of mine is and has been from my youth more precious than country and kin and public advancement. Indeed, for me, it is these things. And that is why I venture to claim the first place in Greek literature, a very bold claim, since Alexander, about whom I write, held first place in the profession of arms. A, uh, a very important statement indeed. And Arian does give us an extremely accurate account of the military exploits of Alexander. And I have tended to follow Arian in many of the essentials when dealing with the military side of Alexander, although we have these other three accounts plus this epitome by Justin and other sources. The second most important account is by Plutarch, Plutarch of Chaeronea. Uh, he too was a Greek living in the Roman Empire. 
uh, born around 46 A.D. and died in 120 A.D. Uh, he wrote uh, a number of works that have come down to us, and he was primarily a moral philosopher, and he was a practitioner of what we would probably call Middle Platonism, that he was um, devoted to the uh, practices and theories of Plato and augmented uh, the, those theories. He wrote a number of important philosophical treatises, works on morality. But he also wrote uh, biographies. Uh, the most important set of biographies are the parallel lives. And in this case, he compares Alexander the Great to Julius Caesar. And this is a uh, combination that he pursues, that is, there's a life of a famous Greek compared to a life of a famous Roman. Unfortunately, Plutarch never wrote in uh, a life of Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, uh, one of Plutarch's great omissions. In any case, Plutarch too drew on Ptolemy and the sources that Arian used, but he also had access to a number of other sources. Uh, these included accounts that are often known as the Vulgate tradition. It comes from the Latin word vulgus or vulgus, uh, which means the crowd. And these were popular stories about Alexander circulating even in Alexander's own lifetime. They included philosophical writers, some of whom were quite hostile to Alexander, thinking that Alexander had uh, degenerated from a conqueror to a tyrant uh, because of his addiction to drink, or even worse, he became drunk with power. And this goes back to a tradition established in Alexander's own lifetime when Callisthenes, uh, the uh, great nephew of um, Aristotle, ran afoul of Alexander over the issue of proskinesis and was eventually arrested and died a miserable death. And the uh, philosophical schools, the philosophical writers, uh, got uh, uh, wind of this information, and uh, that began a tradition of writing hostile uh, interpretations of Alexander's behavior uh, in his later years, and that passed into this common tradition. So Plutarch made use of these philosophical works. Sometimes he went to great lengths to correct their opinions about Alexander, notably his drinking and his, drunken, his drunk sense of power. In any case, Plutarch provides anecdotes that we otherwise would not have. Many of the best stories that are remembered about Alexander come out of Plutarch's a biography of Alexander, as well as a very short mortal treatise, moral treatise called uh, On the Fortune of Alexander. Plutarch, unlike Arian, was a biographer. And he makes very clear what his purpose is. And therefore, it's useful to read uh, Plutarch's own words about what the purpose of this life of Alexander is all about. And he's writing at the beginning of uh, the biography of Alexander, which is then followed by the bi biography of Julius Caesar. So he's essentially discussing both of these biographies. Uh, Plutarch's words. My subject in this book is the life of Alexander the king and of Julius Caesar, the conqueror of Pompey. The careers of these men embraces such a multitude of events that my preamble shall consist of nothing more than this one plea. If I do not record all their celebrated deeds or describe any of them exhaustively, but merely summarize for the most part what they accomplished, I ask my readers not to regard this as a fault. For I am writing biography, not history. And the truth is that the most brilliant exploits often tell us nothing of the virtues or vices of the men who perform them. While on the other hand, a chance remark or a joke may reveal far more of a man's character than the mere feat of winning battles in which thousands fall, or of marshalling great armies, or laying siege to cities. When a portrait painter sets out to create a likeness, he relies, above all, on the face and the expression of the eyes, and pays less attention to the other parts of the body. In the same way, it is my task to dwell upon those actions which illuminate the workings of the soul. Uh, the Greek word here is psyche, from which we get psychology, and it is part of um, uh, Plutarch's uh, philosophical uh, training to stress the importance of the soul, the ultimate reality uh, in any being. This goes back to the uh, um, Plato's Timaeus and the philosophical works of Plato. And by this means to create a portrait of each man's life. I leave the story of his greatest struggles and accomplishments to be told by others, notably Arian. And so Plutarch's account is invaluable. On the whole, Plutarch apparently follows more or less 
uh, the narrative that Arian writes, and that would be the account of Ptolemy and other uh, uh, contemporary sources on the military side of Alexander. So very often, the Plutarch Arian accounts are in uh, sync with each other in, on many details. Uh, this, the third source is an unusual source. Uh, it's written by Diodorus Siculus. He is a Greek of Sicily, writing at the end of the first century BC. His work may have been published around 50 BC or thereabouts. He had access to a number of different sources, and he wrote a universal history. And that is a history that starts from legendary times and goes down to his own day. Now, Diodorus Siclus is an extremely difficult source to use. Uh, he's one of the sources that one uh, employs in studying classical Greece, particularly the 5th and 4th centuries BC, and he's not always the best of sources. He's only as good as the sources that he himself uses. And in working with Diodorus, particularly on the 5th century BC, I have reason to believe that at times Diodorus gets his chronologies wrong, uh, that he duplicates events, uh, that sometimes he gets confused on, um, on names, and so he has to be used with a certain amount of care. He gives a very different version of the Battle of the Granicus and also the Siege of Halicarnassus in the opening stages of Alexander's campaign. And I tend to follow Arian's account on those two events. On the other hand, Diodorus, uh, for his account on Alexander, which is an entire book of his universal history, Book 17, has access to some apparently very interesting sources that we, would, we wish would have survived. These include uh, sources written by Greeks who were in the Persian service, uh, that is the service of the great king Darius III, the opponent of Alexander, and they give that this account of Diodorus gives us information about those Greeks who were engaged in diplomatic maneuvers to oppose both Philip of Macedon and Alexander the Great. He gives us an insight uh, into the plans of Darius III, particularly on the eve of the Battle of Issus, uh, where Darius uh, consulted with his Greek mercenary commander, Charidemus, and, uh, who is um, a refugee from Athens, who is in his service. He also provides information that we wouldn't otherwise have in these uh, ugly clashes that occurred um, later in the campaign, particularly the trial and execution of Philotus in 330 BC, a very important event uh, we'll be discussing. And for the reign of King Philip, that is, the reign of Alexander's father, he is the main narrative account, uh, because we do not have any contemporary accounts surviving uh, from the time of King Philip or a later version of King Philip's reign, uh, similar to what Arian wrote for Alexander the Great. And so Diodorus becomes an all-important account for us. The uh, fourth account is written in Latin. It's by a Roman author named Curtius Rufus, and we know very little about Rufus. Uh, Rufus is obviously, uh, if not a senator, he's certainly sympathetic to the senators. He writes in some ways in the tradition of Cornelius Tacitus, the historian of the early Roman Empire, uh, who is a brilliant Roman historian. I actually think Tacitus is more a cynic who does history as a sideline. But he writes in that tradition. He has a very skeptical eye of uh, rulers who can turn into tyrants, and he's very conscious of that. He is a, undoubtedly a practitioner of the Stoic doctrines uh, that were common in the Roman ruling class. Uh, he also um, gives us information, and we're not at, at times sure whether this is really accurate to Alexander's day or reflects more Rufus's own day, and that is uh, Alexander is always consulting with his officers on the eve of the battles. Uh, Arian and Plutarch see uh, Alexander as the great commander, and they don't tell us that much about the subordinates, uh, other than that Parmenio, the second in command, is essentially the cautious foil to Alexander and always being overruled. But in Curtius Rufus, uh, the officers are there in council. Uh, it's led some historians to argue, based on Curtius's account, that really all Alexander was uh, was a uh, heroic cavalry commander and king who inspired the army, and it was a group of professional officers who really directed and won the battles. And that's, that's a position that I do not subscribe to. I think that's a misreading. And in part, Rufus is probably reflecting Roman practice. Roman commanders did carry out such councils of war with their officers, even down to the centurion 
historian level. And so sometimes when I'm reading Curtius's account, I'm wondering, am I really looking more at the practice of the Roman army of the imperial age rather than the Macedonian army of Alexander's day? On the other hand, Rufus has marvelous information on flora and fauna. He delighted in the exotic. Uh, in earlier uh, times, in the late 19th and early 20th century, when the beginning of modern scholarship on these sources, uh, a lot of these descriptions were just dismissed as fanciful. Uh, but some of them have now been borne out. One of them most dramatically in 1993 by Michael Wood, who did this uh, idiosyncratic documentary uh, on Alexander the Great in the footsteps of Alexander the Great, uh, which does not pretend to be a account of Alexander's life, but really looking more at the influence that Alexander had. And at one point, Curtius Rufus gives us a description of a dry riverbed in northern Iran where Alexander and 500 mounted infantry made a record dash to capture Darius III. It's been dismissed. And Michael Wood has found that dried riverbed. And so uh, Wood has actually very uh, uh, successfully pointed out several cases where Rufus' account is um, accurate, and it's been a major you know, contribution into appreciating uh, Curtius Rufus as a source. We do have other sources. The one I want to mention first is a, a Latin epitome written at the end of the second, beginning of the third century AD by a fellow named Justin. Uh, we know little about Justin. He was making essentially the Reader's Digest version of a history of Macedon based on an account by a Latin author known as Pompeius Trogus, who wrote a very detailed account in Latin about Philip II and Alexander the Great. And that Latin account goes back to contemporary uh, histories, notably a history by Theopompus, who wrote on the reign of Philip II. Would that we had Theopompus's account. We don't. What we have is a Latin abbreviation of the Latin version of that history. Nonetheless, Justin does prove important at times. Um, there was a papyrus fragment discovered and published of a, um, or of a Greek history. It's, it's in Greek. It's very often known as the Hellenica Oxyrinca, that is the Greek history from Oxyrinkus, the town in Egypt. And there is a belief of some scholars that this is part of the lost history of Theopompus. Uh, it covers events in the early 4th century BC before Philip's accession. And actually, the account is very good from what we can tell in the narrative that survives. We have the orations of Demosthenes, the uh, virulent opponent of Philip II, as well as uh, orations by Isocrates, Aeschines, Hyperides, and other leading figures in Athens. Archaeology and uh, coins and inscriptions, these would be public decrees put up on stone, add greatly to our knowledge. We'll be drawing on that information as well. So all of these sources together allow us to create not only the career of Alexander, but also the world in which Alexander lived, and also the career of Alexander's parents, Philip II and Olympias, who had an immense importance on shaping Alexander, uh, especially the mother, uh, Olympias. Uh, some would argue Alexander is, in some ways, the original mama's boy. He was devoted to his mother. And all of this information has been transmitted to us uh, from antiquity. Now, modern scholars have very divergent, divergent opinions about Alexander, and it's necessary to look at two important views. One view comes out of a British view in which Alexander the Great is an extremely heroic figure. And this goes back into the 19th century, into Victorian Britain, when the British um, upper classes were trained in their Latin and Greek, and they were taught uh, Demosthenes and Thucydides and the, all of these authors, and they saw Alexander as a great hero. They also saw the Athenian democracy as equivalent to the British parliamentary order of the 19th century. This goes back to the general history of George Grote, uh, published uh, between 1846 and 1856. And so the Athenians are the good guys, and Philip II turns out to be the tyrant. But Alexander gets a pass because of his great exploits. He was held up as a heroic figure, one that was noble and chivalrous. And these 19th century images, which are in part based on not only the images of antiquity, but medieval visions of Alexander as a knight, a chivalrous knight, which was common in Western Europe, these images were essentially summed up in the uh, biography of W.W. W. Tarn, uh, published in 1948 in two volumes. Uh, and that vision of Alexander by Tarn is the heroic, romantic vision that is very common today. It's actually the vision of Alexander the Great shared by most Greeks. It's the vision of Alexander evoked 
1821 uh, to 1832 in the Greek War of Independence that saw, saw the establishment of the Kingdom of Greece out of the Ottoman Empire. And yet this vision of Alexander is overdrawn. Uh, Tarn, in particular, sees Alexander as not only a chival chivalrous knight, but a perfectly good Victorian gentleman who would have tea with the queen, and at times he just dismisses the sources out of hand if it doesn't fit that image. You know, Alexander wouldn't do that, it's just not, you know, it's not cricket. Uh, actually, Tarn's vision of Alexander at times gets so her heroic that there's no way Alex would have survived the violent uh, politics of the um, Macedonian court. Uh, the other image comes out of the scholarly tradition of German scholars writing in the 19th century, uh, particularly a brilliant uh, scholar, uh, Johann Gustav Droidsen, who lived between 1808 and 1884 and penned a very important history of Alexander the Great. And that history of Alexander the Great saw Alexander and also his father, Philip II, as builders of nation states. And the Germans appreciated the Macedonian kings in a way that uh, the British did not in the 19th century. And that tradition of the great leader that could f uh, fashion a state uh, became the staple of German scholarship. Now, um, one of the best views of that is uh, written by Ulrich Wilken, uh, published in the 1930s before the Nazis took power. And Wilken's account of Alexander in some ways is still the best. Uh, he understands the pothos, the yearning, the desire of Alexander to emulate his ancestors. And that, that biography is still translated uh, in English and available. Uh, however, the tradition turned in a direction after the experience of uh, Nazi Germany and scholars writing after uh, 1945 saw Alexander in a very different light. German scholars saw Alexander as a Hitler figure, sometimes as a Stalin figure. And this has influenced some of the most important works written in English uh, by Ernst Badian, professor at Harvard, who is a brilliant historian who has written numerous articles on Alexander, and uh, by an Australian scholar, A.B. Bosworth, whose works on Alexander are important, particularly his work on Alexander in the East, and they see Alexander far more as a tyrant. Uh, in some cases as a megalomaniac uh, rather than as a conqueror and hero. And they act as a very good antidote to the vision of Tarn, although they too uh, go overboard. And I tend to think that of all the modern scholars, Vilken may have come closest to understanding Alexander. Uh, it's remarkable that uh, there isn't as widespread a popular image of Alexander. There are the novels of Mary Renault, clearly a very fine novelist who invoked the Greek world, Fire from Heaven, Persian Boy, and Funeral Games. These are all novels in which Alexander figures, at least in part. And those novels are good, but they're really not as good as her earlier novels, uh, notably uh, The Last of the Wine and The King Must Die, dealing with uh, classical Athens and uh, the distant Mycenaean Minoan past. There have been two attempts at movies, uh, big Hollywood screen movies, and those are uh, the 1956 uh, Alexander the Great, uh, uh, written and directed by Robert Rosen, and then the more recent Oliver Stone in 2004. Neither epic film captures Alexander very successfully. I think that Rosen's screenplay is better, at least in the early stages. There's a very nice matchup of Richard Burton as the young Alexander and Frederick March as Philip, uh, but the film very quickly degenerates into a rather choppy narrative, and it really isn't one of the better supporting casts, uh, and on the whole, the film doesn't really work. I think there's even less success with Stone's film, even though he went through great efforts to recreate the ancient world. There's a marvelous recreation of Babylon, of the great altars and monuments erected on the Hyphysis after the mutiny in 326 BC. But on the whole, Stone never really has a sense of who Alexander is. I, I think the casting was not particularly well done. Uh, and so uh, the film essentially comes out as being, in my opinion, uh, boring. Uh, for all of the effort, you really walk away with wondering who is Alexander the Great. And I think the problem in coming to terms with Alexander is just the scope of his achievements. It cannot be confined into a two or even, even four hour epic film. You'd essentially have to do a miniseries. And that is because Alexander's impact is so wide ranging. He was devoted to arete or bravery uh, in the Greek tradition, which all 
great heroes such as Achilles, who was Alexander's ancestor, would, um, would seek. He was driven by a pothos, a longing or a yearning that Plutarch and Arian repeatedly stressed that causes him to go out uh, and uh, learn as well as to create great deeds. And above all, uh, he is an epitome, perhaps the best example of how a single individual for all of the restrictions of his generation, can rapidly, fundamentally, and irrevocably uh, change his world. And that is what our task is, to see how Alexander did this and why his memory is so enduring down to this day.